order. So the first I second item is to approve the agenda. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? So hearing none, we'll deem it approved. Third item is comments from the chair. So after much thought, I've decided that I have too much going on in my life and I need to step down from the Planning Commission. And it's not a decision that I've reached lightly. I've been hemming and hawing for months about it, maybe, maybe more like a year. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, just with my mother being sick and my child being young and I just started a new job, I just feel like I can't devote the amount of time and energy to this and all other facets of my life. Um, so I just need to cut back on some of my commitments. So it's nothing personal because working with you all has been fantastic. And I know you're in a really good place. So it, uh, it helps me feel comfortable with stepping down. So my thought was that I would continue for the next meeting. It's the meeting where the Historic Preservation Commission and the Design Review Committee will be attending to present their proposal and I can help with some of the history behind that and talking with the commission about it and then I could step down after that so that you could get a new person in place in July. Um, so you don't feel that just stepping down from being the, the chair would be enough? No, <coughs> it's the time commitment of the meetings. Of the meetings, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not a good time. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it hasn't been too much additional work to be chair because of the great group of people we have here and everybody's readily handled it, you know, taking care of tasks when I'm delegated. So um, it's not, <coughs> it really is the time of the meetings. So. We're sad to see you go. Yeah, I hope that I can rejoin someday when things are a little bit calmer because I have really enjoyed it and I. I, I feel like it's very important to help contribute to the city, and this is a wonderful way to do it. But at this time, it just doesn't seem right. So uh, does anyone have any thoughts on whether that would make sense to come to the next meeting? And or I just The stage where we are with the city plan seems early enough that it would be less disruptive for me to step down now than if I were to wait. What's the city process in terms of they're going to have to advertise? That's what, I was, that's what I was looking at. We've got a 626 council meeting and we've got a 710 council meeting. So certainly that's the, that's the soonest. So ha keeping you on through the 24th is good because the, mm -hmm. the fastest would be the, either the 26th or the 10th. The meeting's in July, and this was going to be in my later notes but I'll mention it now the mm -hmm. July meetings are the 15th and the 29th mm -hmm. so that's the third and fifth not the second and fourth Mondays usually we're the second and fourth Mondays we're gonna be the third and the fifth because DRB needs to shift with things so permanently Mike? no just oh just <laughs> just for the month of July is Book club be will be totally out of. Three of the meetings I'm going to rearrange now. Yeah. Oh. No, it's just for just okay. for that one. That's a really third and fifth. Um, so the 15th and 29th for July. So, so if it's either the 26th or the 10th, either one will mean we would be okay with having a full quorum, potentially full full staffing. For Can I? Just ask a question on the, because I have something about the 30th we have a meeting. Is it the 29th or is it the 30th? Did we? Should be. Talk about like. 15th and 29th. Okay. It must just be a typo or accident. Okay. His 30th would be a Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. I don't think we ever yeah. talked about that. Okay. All right. So I'll submit my resignation letter immediately but I'll make the resignation effective the 25th and then City Council can move forward on it on the 26th and they'll have notice now yep. that they'll need to take up a vote on the 26th and they can post it right so how long do they typically post for this um, depends on how many applicants they get yeah okay well there but should I be some time and could, they could take it up the 10th if they needed to because the Planning Commission won't be meeting 
Yeah, I think they now. could have an appointment done by the 26th, but in the event something comes up that they have to push it to the 10th, that, that still wouldn't affect. Still fine. Yeah. Okay. So I'll do that. Um, as far as leadership is concerned, Kirby and I have been talking about it, and I just sprung this on him too. So um, we agree that it probably makes sense for everybody to just think about it for a couple of weeks, and at the next meeting have a discussion about how you want to proceed with you know, appointing a chair in the meantime. There will be another ele Elections are required every January. It's in our bylaws. So they'll be, you know, you'll need to appoint someone for about six months, and then you'll have an opportunity to elect a new chair in January. So just have that in mind. You can resume. And, and since next week is pretty much booked up, I guess maybe we could plan for the meeting after that, if there's going to be any action on that, so it would be post-Leslie. So that would be then the July 15th? As, assuming that it's okay yep. procedurally, and like so I could fill in as vice chair for that meeting and leave the meeting, but um, maybe plan for July 15th to talk about <coughs> appointing someone until January. Not hearing any complaints. Sounds good. Okay. Maybe Aaron and John have a lot of complaints, but they're not here. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So those are the only things I had for comments for the chair from the chair. So item four on the agenda is general business. Any comments from the public on something that's not already on the agenda? We do have a member of the public here, Marcella. <laughs> I don't know if you have any comments that you want to offer us or... Okay. Yeah, okay, great. Um, okay, so moving on to item five. This is uh, where I remind everybody that we have a joint meeting on June 24th to m meet with the Historic Preservation Commission, and I think the Design and Review Committee will be here too. They'll be invited, yeah. They're invited to discuss the revisions they've made to the zoning bylaws design review process and we talked a little bit about the background on that um, at the last meeting but it's been about a month so as a quick reminder the the design review bylaws had been uh, critiqued when we were dealing with the the big zoning rewrite and we had a lot of pushback on that, and so we sought to make them a little bit clearer um, and to have standards be a little bit less ambiguous, therefore there to be less discretion in the application of those standards, or make the regulations read in such a way that there would be minimal amount of discretion to be applied, because one of the things we were hearing was that it really depended on who was on design review committee as to whether a project would get approved, um, in one way or another way, or if, yeah, so if certain members weren't present, then things would go through, and otherwise they wouldn't, and so we just wanted to try to reduce the amount of discretion that was available under that, because it would offer people more certainty, more applicants a little bit more certainty. Um, that, that idea was not uh, not supported as written by the Design Review Committee and the Historic Preservation Commission because they, they felt like the standards should be, there, ha there necessarily has to be a little bit of discretion in them, but they thought that the Secretary of Interior standard should be the, the applicable um, standards. And, that, and we said, okay, but that's kind of what we have now. Not really, but a little bit. Um, but we need a little bit more clarity behind. I think I think it was was we looked at the Secretary of Interior standards and thought they had way too much wiggle room in them, and and so uh, Historic Preservation Commission said that they would um, apply for a grant and develop a detailed guidebook to help explain how the broader regulations would be applied, and they would have illustrations and examples and. 
So before they go too far down the path of developing that, they want to check in with us, and that's what this meeting is about. So they do have funding for doing the workbook now? Yeah, I think they've been working on it, and I'm not sure how you know, far... They've got the, they got the... What they got was the grant to do the regulations, but they haven't got the grant yet to do the guidebook. Oh, okay. I didn't realize they needed a grant got, to do the regulations. Yeah. We got the draft yeah. regulation. Right? Yes. Yeah, they think... Yeah, they've, there are a number of funding sources. They can go back to their same CLG funding to get some of it for mm. the guidebook. <coughs> but so they the sent us some materials, everybody. and we have shared those with everybody. So um, take a look at them before the meeting next week and or two weeks from now. And if you have any questions, you know, you just, you may, they may get explained as they do their presentation. They're going to give us a presentation, but... They are going to do a presentation. <coughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, they have like a PowerPoint. The PowerPoint. Yep. Okay, yeah. it's actually the same one that's on our Google Drive. Maybe? I would think so. Yeah, because that I think that may, may be the one that was in the public meeting. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, and it's it, meant it to be. It might be the same one as the public meeting. Yeah. But it'd be great if they bring a detailed one. Yeah, that something that's the, more specific that to the, the, re the guidelines, the requirements. Because yeah. they are broadening it in some ways um, beyond what we have now. Well, I think they also want to talk about expanding the district, right? <laughs> I don't think they are. I think they actually have punted on the district lines moving, and they'll keep the lines the same. Okay. One thing at a time. Right. My understanding is that yeah, they're going to want us to deal with that. Oh, like Good make up a recommendation about the lines? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I didn't we tried that. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Maybe we'll leave the lines where they are. Well, <laughs> we we can, but we need more information. I mean, we can't just make a recommendation willy nilly. We need something to base it on. Well, that's what they say. <laughs> 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 no, I think because I think they had the public uh, information gathering process, right? Uh huh. But then, but then at the end of it said. Uh, well, we're not sure about the district lines. <coughs> yeah, and I think we needed to know whether they were going to recommend historic guidelines, historic preservation guidelines, design guidelines, or is it a mixture of both? Because if it's more or predominantly a historic, then we really should go through and adjust the boundaries to take out places that aren't historic. You know, we've got places that um, the properties that are on Memorial Drive, the high school, Green Mountain Power, the state office buildings. I mean, there's nothing historic in there. They're just, but they're all in the design review district. If you're regulating just national for historic, life. national life, you're just reg regulating for historic, you wouldn't need to include those areas in, um, in a historic design review guideline but if it is design review as well or predominantly design review then you may want to consider that because that that's part of the gateway um, so it really kind of comes down to what where the rules are um, what, how do you um, interpret what they've written it's predominantly historic I thought it was more historic okay. but I was going to see what their presentation was I know they didn't want to make a recommendation but certainly makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. So you need separate design review standards if to be developed? Yeah, I think we'd have to see what they've proposed and see if they really work for other in types both of buildings. Con contexts yeah. as well. Huh. Would a new building in a green field have anything to meet if you're looking at mostly the Secretary of Interior standards? <coughs> <coughs> I think we'll see what their presentation is and ask them the questions we need to, and then we can take that issue up as we get into the summer, late summer and the fall and see what we want to do. So I think it's meant to be collaborative. They're looking for this to be a little bit of an iterative process, but we should make sure we acknowledge that they've done a lot of work to get to this point. So mm -hmm. it's just important to keep that in yeah. mind. Yeah, I mean, it's very in-depth. 
Very in depth. Yeah, and I mean it's just a very sensitive issue because what we're talking about is regulating, you know, and design, and that people are. I think it's a little bit more personal than some of the other things we regulate. At least it seems to be in some of the public meetings that we've had. It's been something people have been the most upset about, and they're unfortunately is often this attitude that you know you can trust me you shouldn't regulate mm -hmm. you know the color in my house but oh don't let my neighbor paint their house that color <laughs> you kind of can't have it both ways so it's it's a challenging needle it's, yeah it's needle to thread. Yeah, I'm not I, sure what the right way to couch that metaphor is <laughs> and I think we just have to look at what's um, what historic preservation is proposing and eventually come to a decision of whether that's the direction we want to go because there are going to be other factors that are going to come in later on and I think what they want to know is where where we are going so they know whether to develop the guidebook or how to develop the guidebook because I think certainly when we developed our our rules we talked about looking at things um, like what was the design review proving already? So the design review was always approving, or at least recently, always approving replacement of windows on historic build buildings. So if you w wanted to, you just had to make it historically accurate. Consistent. Consistent with the historic character of that building. But you could put in new windows historic preservation, when we wrote that into our rules, because we said, if you're doing that anyways, let's just put in the rules that says you can do that. If you want to replace your windows, you can replace your windows. You just have to do them historically accurate. The historic preservation really didn't like that. They wanted you to first prove that you couldn't fix that window, and that you had to keep the 100-year-old window if you had a 100-year-old window. Now, that's going to come up with other things. So we may have some good proposed rules that historic preservation supports but we're gonna have to go and see at what point you know is is the design review committee on board as well to go through and start enforcing it because as much as they say they do it they actually I've never seen them force somebody to keep the historic windows at least recently unless it was a, a national register project like across the street but yeah those those usually yes. are forced to by the funders right not by the right. drc by the feds yeah. yeah the feds are making them do it because they want federal funding yeah but even in those projects french block has new windows finally yes, yes. but it took a while right <laughs> yeah they had to get themselves through but it wasn't drc that was making them put no. in the um it was the the feds so the question that comes up is, we just well, actually it was the state, but <laughs> oh, <was> the, state? <laughs> the state was more anyway. But yeah, we don't yeah, need to get into that. More than the than the Fed than the yes, national the register. state HP can be more oh. uh, strict. strict than the federal the federal tax credit source the, the oh, interior. That's yeah. interesting. Too. Sounds yeah. like you've had some experience. With <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, but oh, that yeah. was that was the the. You know, some of the crux of what we were trying to look at when we wrote our set of, of design rules um, for a proposal was that we wanted to reflect what was actually going on so people would have some expectation of knowing if I wanted to replace the windows, I could do it, or if I wanted to replace um, the porch, you know, could I replace the porch with modern material as long as it matched the porch that was on there? You know, could I use pressure treated wood or do I have to use? consistent materials as well and that was you know just a question we, we figured these were things we should be able to prescribe out front and then then that would take the question out of it um, you know you you have to do this unless one two three um, but those rules didn't didn't make it through and so historic preservation commission has come up with a alternative proposal and I think we'll just have to go and evaluate it um, and see see how well it kind of meets what the public is going to want to support. And then once we make a decision and council gets a chance to talk about it, then we would have an opportunity to give them some feedback on their guidebook. You know, is it worth going forward with this? Is your proposal going to actually get passed? And then they'll go back and do a guidebook.
So the process for this document would be to amend it in a series of iterations, and then it would go to council yeah, it just or come to us. It just seems sort of hard to approve regulations without the guidebook when the big concern is that the regulations aren't clear enough. And I think what they they weren't asking for them to be the the regulations to be adopted at this time, okay. but they did want to have some public comments. They did want to have input from the Planning Commission and input from the City Council, but it wasn't going to go up for adoption Okay. because they were in a catch-22. They don't want to adopt guidelines to something that might change, but at the same time, it's, you can't really adopt them without the guidebook. So oh. they're kind of, well, let's go through the process as if we're going to adopt it, take public comment. If we get a lot of negative public comment that says there's no way this is ever going to pass, then they know don't adopt the guidebook, don't work on a guidebook, we've got to do some more work on the rules. Um, or maybe it's just a matter of making a few adjustments to the rules and then move forward with the guidebook adoption. But right now it's coming to us and there are not any uh, public meetings scheduled? There are no public meetings scheduled okay. yet, but I would expect once we hear from them that we would probably want to schedule something to hear from the public on what they think of these these rules. So I guess this is the first of that process. Okay. This is the beginning of that process. So. Um, I'll just ask one more question. So there is their argument for room for interpretation that they have to consider like what kind of historic resource that is, or do you sort of know what their thinking is on why they need interpretation and would not you, kind of like cut and dry, more cut and dry standards. Can you? I'm not quite getting. I, the I just don't. Stuff. I'm not quite understanding why they are saying they need room for interpretation uh, on standards instead of. I think it's more about sticking to what the norm is, which is the Secretary of Interior standards. Oh, which are open. They're to very comfortable with those, but if we did oh. something that was more like explicit, it was more explicit. It, yeah. it would mean us changing those standards. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so it's more about that. Yeah, because I just yeah really highly value, especially if homeowners are going to be affected by this, that they're very clear. And, yes. Yeah. Well, and that's what we <laughs> tried to do. Yeah. Language. Well, it's supposed to, but they haven't written it yet. Right, but that's yeah, the that's the intent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And what we were, we had ended up with was a set of rules that were very similar to the secretary standards, except that we had explicit outs where we said for windows, for windows, windows. and doors and porches, where we said, look, we always approve these anyways. Some materials. Why make people jump through the hoops? Mm -hmm to get approved for getting their windows replaced on their historic building if we're going to approve them anyways. Just go and set the rule that says you can replace them as long as you meet these standards. And Some of the buildings in town that are in the historic, that are historic, that have, commer that are for commercial uses, um, can avail themselves of certain tax credits, I think, mm -hmm. I if they meet the Secretary of Interior standards. And so one of the concerns oh. that the Hi Pre Historic Preservation Commission had was that if we have competing regs, that hmm. it, there's a possibility for conflict. Hmm. Which is, you know, a valid concern. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, this, and I, the state also made it clear that they kind of said that they could remove our CLG status if we didn't follow the Secretary of Interior standards. So, oh, that's even a good reminder. Though, even we, though, I, even though our, our current rules don't meet the Secretary of Interior <laughs> standards, <laughs> if we adjusted them to make them closer to Secretary of Interior standards, that for whatever reason. And that, and that goes for our historic district, though, only, right? We're still. F we're no, that was for the, for the CLG. The so CLG is community wide. Okay. So CLG stands for what? The uh, certified local government. Right. But but historic buildings outside the district aren't reviewed. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yes, which goes to yeah. some of the whatevers that we parsed back and forth with Devon on was to go through and say, yeah, but mm -hmm. we already don't regulate those buildings. Right. We already don't regulate those buildings, and yet. So what did what was the response to that then? 
I mean, when you pointed out that there are buildings that we aren't regulating, uh, we can't require that they follow. I guidelines. wasn't going to push it too far because I didn't oh. want to. Yeah. Put ourselves in a in a, in a double jeopardy of mm -hmm. being of pointing out the fact that we don't meet the regulations and we don't meet the <laughs> district requirements, and then really have Devin in a position where he's going to push back and say, "Well, I'm going to throw you out now." Yeah. Oh, I see. If you don't meet our 100 percent. It's a tenuous so position. I guess. My goodness. I reached a point of stop pushing that when he pushed back on the one. So we'll, and so it's worth just keeping in mind that that was put out there. That one of the reasons we are eligible for certified local government and the grants that they offer is because we meet these requirements. So even though we know, even though we don't. So yeah. but. <laughs> would that inform the boundaries of the design review district? Mm -hmm. It could. It's worth. It's worth. Certainly worth um, running that up the flagpole at a certain point to see where what their reaction would be if we passed if we went forward and passed these rules as proposed by Historic Preservation. What would be the pushback from the division? Um, would the division expect us to expand the district to include these other areas, or are they comfortable with what's proposed? And are they basing the their recommendation on the Federal Register? Theirs is still following the arbitrary boundary that has been under our rules. Our boundary follows nothing. It just is. R right. Well, nobody knows exactly zoning. why it was established the way it was, is what Mike's trying There's to say. There's no rhyme or reason yeah. to... It doesn't follow um, the historic district lines. It doesn't follow any zoning district lines. It doesn't follow... The, the, the only requirement that we must keep is we must have his, uh, we must have design review for the designated downtown. So that is the only really hard and fast thing. If we adjusted the boundary such that parcels were removed from the designated downtown, we could jeopardize our designated downtown status, which we obviously wouldn't want to do. Um, but that's really a pretty tight for uh, properties. And what? Right now it's pretty, it's bigger than that by a decent Yeah, it is bigger than that by quite a bit. It involves neighborhoods and portions of neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't cover all of the historic district currently. The designated downtown, is that just the urban core? Mostly just the urban core in Downstone Cutters Way. So how, I don't know, maybe we should ask this next week, but with, with writing and asking questions here. Okay, um, how does a town establish their initial National Register District? I mean, Barb, you're a historic architect. Well, Do you have any knowledge? Well, that? I have no idea how Montpelier arrived at theirs. I think right, that we've established that. that. Yeah. Um, but I think there was a survey, there have been several surveys done, and somehow By when historic they Preservation yeah, specialists you know, um, basically make the listing mm -hmm. and then send it to the Secretary of the Interior. Okay. Um, and um, so they, I think they just started with the downtown, and then it seems to have grown just sort of beyond what would be considered the urban core. Should and we apply for a grant for a survey to be done? The, that's what was done two years ago and was finally approved. Oh, so they remapped. Our, ours and included a few more properties that were that had been skipped before. So usually, what you want for your historic district is buildings that are of a, of a similar time period in a similar. I don't, know, I don't want to say theme, but it's, right. they're of a similar character. Character, right? And so usually, you may have a downtown that's broken into um, four different historic districts. For some reason, we just became one big one, but a lot of other places would have a number of smaller historic districts. I think I remember looking at um, Hardwick's, which is where I live, and I think they have three historic districts in their downtown core. Um, one that's just you know one that was built within this time period and tended to follow these. You know, this mm. was you know 1840s. These were all built in Greek Revival, and the city you know town started over here. Then when the granite industry came in, the, the, it expanded, and so here's a second historic district that's right 
next to that historic district, and then there's a third one that covers another area. So you end up, most places have these piece by piece, but they all kind of connect. connect. Right? Yeah. Um, That's interesting. I didn't realize that. Even some places as small as Harvard would do that. Yeah, they would have multiples. I mean, that's why this is the biggest in the state. It, it's, you know, because usually you'll break this into a number of smaller historic districts. But and we they could have different, still, they have different still. rules, which would be each, each mm, one. Or they just would have the same rules, but you, when you talk about being of the character of Compatible. Of compatible, compatible with the character, you, yeah. you oh. wouldn't want to go through and build a, you know, somebody proposes, a, you know, yeah. a, something that takes a few themes of Federalist and decides to stick it into a Greek Revival neighborhood and, you know, the architects and everyone will go and say, wait a second, this is an 1840s, 1860s neighborhood District. and you're going to try to insert this historic looking 1890s feature it's you know it, it seems like we are wrestling with that because we have a downtown that's commercial buildings that are brick and then we have residential neighborhoods running right up to them and they really are of different themes or characters yeah but and it's pretty but, easy to identify when those mm -hmm. groups were built because oftentimes it seems as if they were built by similar contractors and at similar time periods because we can see the early maps of Montpelier it's you know many of the existing historic buildings weren't on it, it seems, yet. seems like something to ask next week Interesting, or yeah. next meeting. but the the design the historic surveys were all done just looking at what's on the ground not with an intention of turning them into design review districts what happened is they, they surveyed it, um, so that way they would have records of what the historic buildings are, and also because of the changes at the at the federal level for how federal money would be spent and its impacts on historic resources, you had to have the maps. You can't put highways to the historic downtowns as easily um, if are, you know where the historic buildings are. Are so. you saying that we could have uh, multiple historic districts some of which w could follow the Secretary of Interior standards as the Historic Preservation Committee wants, and some of them could maybe not have design review standards, as long as they're not that in our... That would be a question for Devin. We, as we long as they're not in our designated downtown, I think would be yeah. one obvious caveat there. But. So who's or Devin? Devin is a state... Devin Coleman. Coleman he works in Division. the Historic Preservation okay, Office or yeah. whatever yeah. the... Yeah, de uh, Department of Historic Preservation. Yeah. I think it's DHD. Yeah. 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 So he's not the shipo though. The floor yeah, treasurer. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting so what you asked Kirby though. I mean, those we could have separate districts that just might not have to meet the Secretary of the Interior standards, but could still have design review. You know, mm -hmm. rather than not having any design review on those well, district districts. Uh, Part of part of what I was baking in there was to try to avoid being over too overly complicated. Yeah, yeah, if right. If we're I'm having multiple districts, it would be fine. If like really the only purpose of them, from what I'm understanding here, mm -hmm. is that that just means that when they're looked at and judged, they're going to be kind of more in a vacuum among like what's going on there, mm -hmm. which is so there won't be apples and oranges stuff going on, which seems to make a ton of sense and it does make sense for Montpelier. So maybe that sounds like a need. But at the same time, yeah, maybe the, that would help us with the problem of having the Secretary of Interior standards, which are very comprehensive, and then maybe for some of the neighborhoods in town, we know that the people there don't want that kind of regulation when it comes to design review. So could our like elegant solution involve having multiple districts and some of them having this, the yeah. Department of Interior standards and some not? So I think and then, yeah, but that's an added layer of complication with like whether or not well, have yeah, but design review, but that's that's not so originally what we proposed, isn't it? <laughs> it's getting closer to yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I but think, in a different way. yeah, so I'll just run. So, the if we if we take out the CLG and we take out the designated downtown, there's no requirement under state law, no requirement under federal law that we do any design review. We don't have to do anything. The only time we have to is when we've got these other two pieces. And obviously, I don't think the designated downtown will be an issue because I don't think anyone is going to propose to shrink anything to the point that it's less than the designated downtown. 
So, because um, that really is just the urban core. All, almost all those buildings are eligible for tax credits, so uh, you know, I don't think we would ever, ever not do that. But the CLG will be one that we'll just have to work with the state to see um, how they how they handle it and what their expectations are. Um, so in other words, if historic preservation goes through and gets another certified local government grant and does work to get the meadow its own historic district, which has been talked about, it's not in our this is not in our historic district, but it's mostly historic. The college has a lot of historic properties um, in and around it. Um, that could be a separate historic district. Um, but if they put those in, are we then obligated as a CLG to then do design review up there as well? That's an answer I don't know. Yeah. Um, and that, that will probably go to your other question related, which is what about these areas like Loomis and Liberty that are in our historic district now but are not in design review, is the state going to force us to move our design review boundary out to capture those? Are you one of those? Neither. No. The, the historic district stuff's next door to me. So it doesn't come up very far at the Liberty, about half, you know, even halfway. Hmm. But, yeah. yeah, your St. It Saint comes Paul to Street a is, Graham, yeah. Graham Terrace, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, uphill grant terraces, and anything. Yeah. So yeah, it's, and I know that was one of the issues that was brought up when the public with the public comment is that there are lots of other neighborhoods, particularly around the college, that could benefit from uh, historic review, and they're not part of it. But anyway, yep. it's just for hires. A lot of public outreach. And yeah, and then it, the whole idea of expanding the districts is difficult. Well, I mean, I think making a list of all of the reasons why it would benefit the city is very important. I mean, it opens us up to grants in a way. I mean, right now we're, they're available to us, but they're under threat mm -hmm. if we don't get our districts cleaned up district boundaries down, district boundaries cleaned up um, I think that there are some level of certainty for property values that could be offered by living in a in a neighborhood that is historic and subject to review for that so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing but we need to be strategic about it and we need to think about where we want to have more infill and where we want to have more housing because we don't want to let this prevent that growth either so it's it's complex you haven't really talked about that but I think yeah that is going to be a sort of elephant in the room like maybe need to learn more about what's being proposed next week but I think yeah are you thinking about for new construction specifically? Yeah, to make sure that, that there's there's little to no interference with new construction, or 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 at the very least, no inter, in, no impact on, or at least for me, it would be important to have no impact on what's done internally within a building as far as adding oh, no. units. Yeah. But but even new construction, like which we need. We do have some requirements for new construction in terms of massing and articulation, but um, right now, yeah. um, but sometimes that becomes difficult in, in residential areas. So, but we do have some, right, Mike? But yeah, there's some, and the question I think will come up is, um, what happens when somebody wants to put an addition on to have an accessory dwelling unit are we putting barriers up to that if somebody wants to put a tiny house in the backyard what barriers does mm -hmm. to design review put up it may it may be not much not the answer much. may be not much but I think those are the questions that anytime you start putting in a new layer or expanding a boundary you're gonna have the question come up is this going to interfere with energy is this going to interfere with housing is this going to interfere we have a number of goals that we want to accomplish <coughs> and does do these new rules present barriers or do we have enough flexibility to work through those to, to be able to protect the historic character because I think that was 
Kim's concern when he was here as chair was that he felt there wasn't enough of a strong advocate. And the reason why historic our, our design review rules failed was because we didn't have enough of an advocate. We weren't pushing for why this is important. Why is historic preserving historic buildings important to Montpelier? Because it's what you know. It's 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 our history. It's our bones. It's what makes us who we are. And we really should be. The community should be embracing embracing us. Yeah, yes, embracing and embracing it. these ideas of going in and protecting a historic character and. And because we didn't have enough of an advocate there, we, we didn't have our, you mentioned a couple of groups that used to exist and really used to be big and pushing and making sure the community understood the value of it. <coughs> so I, think, I think this is just going to be a challenge, and I think it's nothing we haven't well, worked yeah. through before. But I, I think don't think the historic preservation and development and new growth are mutually exclusive, but they have often been seen that way. I mean, I think that's, I mean, ideally, even even if, if we expand the boundaries and we do some things um, that look like an expansion or, or, or making a stricter, you know, regulation for historic preservation, if at the same time we're very careful to make sure that the, the we're, we're, that we can tell people that this is that this is not going to interfere with our energy or our housing goals, that like like what we're proposing, um, if, if we can get to the point where that or we can say that. Um, I think that'll help a lot. Selling it to people. Yeah. Yeah, I know Eric Gilbertson has some opinions about the the argument we hear often that newer windows are more energy efficient. But at the same time, everybody I know wants to replace the old windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, I think I, I don't think it's for like for us to like to in talking with the public. Um, you've got to make sure that yeah that, that people are able to do like the things that they that they want to do, and while we keep historic character, as opposed to like them having concerns and us saying, well, actually, like. Um, has to be the original windows or the original materials. Yeah, because I don't. I think I don't know if that's. I think Kirby's us. saying we shouldn't just say, "Well, actually, your windows are just right. as efficient as." Oh yeah, well, yeah. You know, that trying kinda. to counter that argument, but you know, and then, I mean, we had a lot of arguments for replacement before, only one of which was lead paint, mm -hmm. and in the existing buildings, it's a huge, huge problem with windows. Yeah. The lead paint, or yeah, the because all the old windows were painted with lead paint. And yeah, you know, take a double hung window and you put it up and down, you've got lead paint dust in the air, and then you know, children don't have to lick it, you know, just to be affected by it. So, mm -hmm. there's a health and safety issue, too. So, we did discuss that when we talked about windows. So, I haven't seen any, any addressing of that in here, but there might be in the proposed. proposed okay. Any other thoughts about this before we move on? We'll get to revisit it on our next agenda item. It's a which lot is longer than ours was. <laughs> Their yes, it is. It is. <laughs> it's going to double the size of ours. Yeah, well. <laughs> zoning. Hmm. Our zoning has not been accused of being brief. I'll so, say that. Hmm. But it's hard. You want to you want to try to address everything and be specific. You have to. And yeah, you have to. There's just no way of being short. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So city plan. Next item on the agenda. Item six. City plan. So um, we a month ago when we met, we were going through the list um, that Barb transcribed at our all committees kickoff meeting of the three goals that the committees who attended and had representatives for presented. And I've changed offices and I don't know where my notes are for that right now. So I'm going to go off recollection. The minutes have quite a bit of it. The minutes on oh, the, the minutes, okay. The minutes got what we, us through I what we talked about last time. Great. But so we, didn't finish our goals. we didn't finish going through all of them. I, I remembered that we did the Parks Commission and we didn't do the next one which is the Recreation Department Advisory Board, and the minutes support my recollection, which is pretty <laughs> nice. 
I'm finally getting sleep again, which uh, this is evidence of my brain working again. So, no, seriously, 22 months and then just started sleeping. It was great. But, um... Don't listen. <laughs> your baby will sleep like an angel. It sleeps well it now, does. but it won't take naps. No, everybody, everybody has challenges. They all have challenges. Yeah, nobody has it any easier than the other. I'll tell you. Okay, so we went through, and just to recap what we did, um, because it has been a little while, we went through each goal and we talked about the goals that were articulated by the representative from that committee, and we tried to understand it a little bit further, and we came up with some action items about how, oh, we should follow up with this committee, or maybe we should get these two committees together to address their overlapping goals. So I'll find those notes. But um, I thought for now, in order to not slow us down, we should kind of pick up where we left off. And there's not that many left, actually. I just have, um, I'll just rattle them off. I mean, and one is the Development Review Board, and, and I don't think that this is, um, I mean, they're really more regulatory and like adjudicatory. They're not really kind of thinking ahead. They're looking at how to review projects. So, did they come up with anything? I can't remember. They did. Well, we can go through it, okay. but um, I'll list them off, and then we can go back and go through them one by one. So, I have the Recreation Department Advisory Board, the Tree Board, Complete Streets, which I think we talked about, um, Development Review Board and Historic Preservation Commission. So that's why I said we'll get to come back to this topic. Um, I think maybe we should start with the Historic Preservation Commission because it's fresh on our minds and then I can kind of resume back up at the top of the list. How does that sound? So um, their overarching kind of mission is to advocate for historic properties in walkable downtown, and they've identified three goals to achieve that mission. Just to contextualize that. So the first is to finish their draft regulations. So we've just talked at length about that and the status of that and our role in that process. Um, goal number two is to plan a survey to add structure. So I'm assuming that's what we were talking about. Adding structures means extending the boundary of the... I don't think they're looking to extend the boundary of the current historic district because it's already as it's already the biggest, and so they've kind of said they're going to create new historic districts. Biggest in the state, you mean? Biggest in the state, mm -hmm. yeah. So they expect to add new ones, and as I mentioned, there's the, the meadow has always come up, the college... Um, up, up and around the college. So they would just do like a standalone designation or a, a, of, a of a house, a structure, or a neighborhood? Of, yeah. Of a couple that were. Yeah. They, they were thinking, I think, in that one of neighborhoods, but. They're not thinking about Cliff Street, are they? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I think I think of the city I council. Think, I actually think the Cliff Street's already in, isn't it? In the historic. Was the Cliff Street yeah, design taken out or something? It was we, taken out of the design the, the room. Okay. Donut hole to remove them. Yeah, it was taken out of design. Design review. review. So then that basically takes them out of any kind of. A but they're in. Then they're still in the historic district. Well, I guess the action wasn't particularly clear. So <laughs> maybe that's something that we could see clarification on eventually. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know I, I, my recollection of the vote from City Council was that they agreed to take Cliff Street neighborhood out of design review. I thought it was of the district. You're saying no, they, it wasn't never, out of the district. It was just out of, it was just I'm an exemption. To, I'm trying to think if they were in the district to begin. An with. exemption that's they been were. carved out. No, they were. They were. They were because that's well, that was part that of was the our, part of our argument why yeah. we said they should, they should stay, stay in, in design because review. Because they're in. Right. They've been surveyed. But I understood from Mayor Watson, who may not have been mayor at the time, but she was certainly on city council, was that I mean, she was the one who made the motion, was that there should be an opportunity to revisit this decision yes. in the future, right? That's yes. accurate. It wasn't permanent. Yeah. So, 
I think, you know, that needs to be part of the discussion about them wanting to add new structures and, and need to ensure that we understand the rationale very clearly before we agree to anything. And we're going to hear from that neighborhood. We should just anticipate that. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as part of my download of information. So um, goal number three is incentives for owner-occupied historic properties. So what are your thoughts, Barb? Do you think that this is meant to pass on some sort of tax credit or something that the commercially uh, use historic properties have to owners who well, live in there? Well, something, because they can't apply for those um, through the federal register, but it would certainly be an incentive to the owners, and I don't know that we even, that they even talked about what form that might take, but it would have to be something that would come from the city, I would think, because it's not, it's not a federal requirement. But it certainly could give them owners a reason to do the right thing. Then why would it just be owners and not owner-occupied buildings and not oh. residential buildings? Was it? It was owner-occupied. That's what it says. Incentives for owner-occupied historic structures. Was there? Hmm. I mean, I. I think if it was not owner-occupied, it would. It could be defined as a public building, but and therefore qualify for tax credits. Even if even it's if residential, it's a couple two units or something. Maybe they just I'm use not that an expert on that one. Term as the other side of the coin from commercial. Yeah, maybe they mean residential. Because if it's not owner occupied, then it's a rental, and so it would be commercial. Maybe that's all they meant. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. They know yeah. more than I do on the specifics of that. That's a that's an expert committee. But yeah, that's that actually could be true that owner occupied. I mean, the um, rental units could potentially be eligible. Because I know John Anderson talked yeah. about his units um, in B and B's state. Yeah, he's, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah. And we've identified potentials for conflict with this um, goal two and goal three. So goal two, adding new historic structures. Goal three, instead <coughs> to owners for owner-occupied historic structures. Maybe not so much. But definitely goal two is potentially conflict with additional housing and energy goals, right? Well, I mean, no, we, the, not the new, regs, not new yeah. construction. This is for existing buildings. Add neighborhoods. Add structures to historic properties. Yeah. District. Yeah, but like if there was a deteriorated property that was historic and they wouldn't let you tear it down, would that apply? I Actually, we have other requirements for demolition. Okay. So which we wrote pretty carefully regarding historic properties, I thought. Um, but in terms of repair, that might, it might fall into, but I don't, I still don't think it's gonna affect new construction significantly. Do you, Mike? Uh, no, I think the number one, I think the finishing, the, whatever comes out of the regs will, will have, just expanding the national or creating a new national historic district or adding new structures on, they don't, think would. My concern with the, uh, if, if we're talking about goal two, which was the um, incentives for owner-occupied, my concern there would be having public tax money that's, that's gathered from everyone and then redistributed perhaps to the people who are the best in position to take advantage of this, which might. I think likely to be the wealthiest people in town. Fancy houses. Yeah, and I think that I think the the distribution problem there is is one for me. We already have money available for people to add um, accessory units, for example. The city's already providing funding, some funding for that, which could also therefore mean bigger houses. The argument to accessory units and things that at least you're adding units. Maybe there's renters. Maybe there's someone else that mm -hmm. can benefit. Mm -hmm. With this, it would be oh, to replace your windows. And, and specifically single family, if we're defining owner-occupied as, as a single family. Well, I mean, by definition, you have to be an owner of a house to get the credit. Yeah. Hmm. 
but also, you know, we had some several requirements in the old zoning that required owner occupant. For example, to add the accessory unit that used to be owner occupied buildings, right? So maybe that's a holdover. I mean, we could specify instead or ask them what they might think about switching this from owner occupied to multifamily yeah. or use it as an incentive to add accessory. Yeah, and we can see, I've, I've been working with them a little bit, um, okay. the Historic Preservation Commission, on, um, on some of their implementation strategies to, to develop um, their plan chapter. So we have had some discussions about, and I just threw ideas out for them to consider. So I know they're working on how they want to, you know, that those are the strategies that go to accomplishing their goals. And so I'm working with them on that right now. So maybe they'll have some ideas um, that they didn't have back in August when it, it was just looking at incentives for owner-occupied. Maybe they've moved to a different set of goals. So it could still be incentives, but not specifically to narrowly to owner occupied yeah i mean we have different incentives in the city right now for putting up solar panels we don't charge building fees right. building permit fees to put up a solar panel and you can get different you know, there are different incentives we can give that aren't all cash incentives that's true yeah um you know, it's interesting, I'm looking at their kind of their mission statement that they have offered us, um, and it says advocate for historic properties in walkable downtown. The walkable piece kind of catches my eye. Uh, do you think there, the idea is that having more connected historic structures will increase interest in walking in the downtown? I'm trying to figure out how these two things connect. Unless walkable it defines a specific area that's close to the downtown, as opposed to outlying neighborhoods. Yeah, I see. I see. This like it's like if there's a visitor who's visiting downtown, anything that's walkable from the downtown would be what we were trying to emphasize for. Okay. Yeah. Because um, this is advocate for historic properties and walkable downtown, not in walkable oh. downtown, but it could just be a typo from. Could have been, yeah, yeah, what they said at the time, yeah, but it wasn't specifically okay. what they meant, yeah, and that would make a little more sense, okay. All right, so going back up to the middle of the list where I was, so the Recreation Department Advisory Board, um, which I'm not terribly familiar with them, Mike, do you work with them much? No, no, I mean, and I know the Parks Commission, so I think the Rec Advisory Board must be um, who Ernie reports to or gets feedback from. Okay. So their goals are, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, these are notes, but the first bullet says, what to do with 55 Berry Street, old rec building. We need to plan for the future needs of the city, and that's one building that they're trying to figure out how to do that. Is that a historic building? <laughs> it is a historic That's what I thought. Yes. <laughs> it is, the, I believe it's uh, old armory. Yes. Was it an armory? Oh, it would make sense. It looks like, yeah. So we have a restricted ability to change the exterior, the facade, right? Well, it's, it, it's got so many issues on the interior as well that the whole building, because of asbestos, right? Is that part of it? It's got lots of. It's got asbestos. It's got lead. Oh, yeah. um, it had a it had a shooting range in the basement, so it's got. Oh. That's where they yeah, the police qualifications qualifying. I mean, so there's just a lot of things that were there. Plus, it has multi levels, and to make it ADA accessible, you need to put in an elevator. My understanding is that actually the plan now is actually to retrofit the building and keep it. Retrofit in what way? Uh, add the elevator and go through. I think that I think it's still in the it's still in the development phase. The idea of cause I think this is where the jump and splash debate came in last year, where there was a lot of discussions of do we want to have a regional, larger uh, swimming everyone pool, wants a pool recreation community center, and 
if we had that, we wouldn't need 58 Berry Street. We could demolish it and maybe use it as a small park or a small parking lot or whatever was the... No more parking lots. I'm no. just saying what no. was said. <laughs> People on Berry Connection. Street would like to have a place to park off street. And Connection to the, the bike path yeah. from Berry Street. So there right. was a, a number of opportunities that were presented. If the building weren't there, we could do we could repurpose that lot for something else. Um, so my understanding was after the, the CNA and the, the, so the, the needs assessment was done that the decision was to keep, to not do the regional and to keep that building and to retrofit it to fit our needs. I think they're developing now what the costs are because you're going to have to come up with a plan and the costs so they can bond for it because it will be a multi-million dollar improvement. But what, what is it, what will fit our needs? What is it that we're uh, retrofitting that, it for? That would be a question for them. I okay. Think you'd but for recreation, pickleball right? And basketball Can, and, continue yeah. to be used for recreation. Yes. Okay. It continues to be used for recreation. Because right now it is being used for recreation, but yep. not very well. It's difficult. Yes. Okay. And if you were good. having a physical disability, that would probably make it impossible for you to get in there. Yeah. Because it's even in the door. Yeah, even in the door. You're coming up multiple steps. Is that is that address 55 or 58? I thought it was 58. Yeah, the notes say 55, but <laughs> yeah. I trust my yeah, I, wrote, I, I wrote 58. But I just, took the notes on the, yeah, so don't go by those. Could be 55 unless 58 is the senior center across the street, and that's why 58 sticks in my head. I don't know. Oh, it doesn't mean. Uh, very strict. You know where it is. The rec you know center. what building yeah. you're talking about. Does everybody know what building we're talking about? Okay. <laughs> okay. Do any do any like middle school kids use that building? The Brexit? Yeah. Yeah. Some people play basketball there. Okay. It's a lot of pickup basketball yeah. there, right? Mm -hmm. You just show up and you can play. Yeah, I know when I'm leaving to go back, I park in Stonecutter's Way, so I've got to walk over and walk by it. So when I go by at six, there's always parents picking up kids. So, so it's always open. I think it locks up at some point. <laughs> I don't do you think know they just leave it open all okay. the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. They, okay. Do they have classes there yeah. or anything like that? Um, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I took the fitness can, hooping class there. there. Oh, yeah? Uh, <laughs> I don't think she goes there for Zoom, though. But I've been to kids' birthday parties there. Yeah. So. Oh, this sounds really kind of like a dangerous place to have kids' birthday parties. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's just a, a lot of the contamination stuff is in the basement. That's where the cleanup stuff is. Yeah, people aren't... Swimming around in Jeez. lead paint and asbestos. <laughs> and Mike, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, we went. It was a dungeon-themed uh, birthday party. Oh, and, uh, we were digging in the. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 Strange <laughs> child. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad venue for for that. Actually, it's a lot of space. Yeah. A lot of running around for like, four-year-olds. Yeah, oh, that sounds good. So, and I think, I think it. Katie takes the girls there for the, there's like a gym class or something. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, I just realized my child goes there too. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so their second bullet for the Recreation Department Advisory Board is infrastructure needs, and they have pool house, et cetera, written here. So my guess is that we have these facilities and we're not supporting them with money. Is that fair to say? Yes. So, I, so we need to do there that. There are a number of these ones that we are able to and have done a good job of keeping up you know, the pool and the tower and all everything there. But there are a number of things that have been that have needs, including the pool house. It's I the maintenance was, that gets you. you it's know? the maintenance. I think mm -hmm. the, the mountaineers have some stuff where the, where the, you need to the box where they do the calls from and stuff that's Is it anything that's underneath to be the fixed. stands? You know that they have some spaces underneath the span stands that are being used, but yeah. I don't know what shape those are in. Yeah. I just know there was a number of those that have been highlighted, and I think yeah. that's on the okay. list of, um, because we have a facilities director who was approved in the budget, and we should be posting for hiring 
some point this summer or fall. I can't remember if they come on in October or it January. Was, it was a partial year. Partial right year. The, yeah. First year. Yeah. So that person will have their work cut out for them. So, I mean, this seems like something we can put in a city plan. You know, the goals are to ensure adequate funding for our, our infrastructure, and there's pretty easy measurables in there, unlike some of these goals. You know, so, so yeah. we can actually easily track. Um, but it, we have to determine what the priority is for that, you know, compared to the green print and other things. So, okay, and then the last bullet for the Recreation Department Advisory Board is to provide recreational opportunities for all residents. So I think it must be speaking to a variety of operation of recreational opportunities and uh, the location of probably where they're provided, I so, guess. So would that extend to the river? I mean, access to the river for people to boat? You know, to, I mean, where's the overlap with other? So I think some of this is, has been helped greatly by the fact that they are now a combined department. So we used to have a separate recreation department. In fact, Arnie used to be working for the schools as a part of the rec department. Mm -hmm. Now the rec department left the schools and is now part of the city. Uh -huh. So the rec department, the parks, trees, and the senior center have all been merged into a community as a community services department. Mm. Rec, parks, and trees. And, and senior. senior. Oh. Community services. So that's, that was one of the things Jesse mm. did just before she left was to work on getting a merger of those departments. They haven't finished figuring out how to put it all together yet. Um, there was, you know, there's still, I, I think it's that's why they're work in, the in progress okay. to kind of figure out how to how to be able to, to balance resources and needs and, you know, obviously that question of, you know, we want to park within 10 minutes walk of every neighborhood, but what if it's a recreational, you know, what if it's a, a ball field instead of a park? Hmm. And is a ball field not just a different type of park, you know? And so I think there's just being able to balance these um, parks, parks, rec, senior, um, and events and, and doing these various different things they were just trying to coordinate and I know it also starts to come down when you start talking about how to maintain things um, parks might have some things that need to get mowed and the rec department might have a lot of lawn mowers well if you're one department it becomes a lot easier just to go through and say this is all that needs to be mowed we're gonna buy one set of lawn mowers mm -hmm. and we don't care yeah which one we're, we're mowing a bigger at budget. the same time if we need you know a large tractor well the parks department has a tractor we don't have to buy one for the rec department if the parks department has one you're all you're all the same department now so we can share resources um, and i think they're just still they're still figuring themselves out um, because unlike other departments there isn't a director of community services it's a department that includes three different directors oh hmm. so they still have some pieces to work out, and that was part of the discussion. Were they going to make a hierarchy, or were they not going to? Um, they just I'm go to sue when they need to decision <laughs> tiebreaker. <laughs> when they need the tiebreaker, I don't know. Um, it has it, it. It seems as though I, everybody's been very happy with it so far. Um, there was a proposal as to whether or not cemeteries should be included in that. Mm -hmm. And cemeteries has opted to sit, to stay out. So cemeteries is not part of the community services. Just thinking of Brexit. Okay. I was thinking about sharing lawnmowers. Oh. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Brexit. Okay. <laughs> so. Brexit. Brexit. <laughs> um, tree board. Their mission is to make the city literate about trees to educate citizens, and they've identified three goals. Well, I guess they're kind of related. They're not all under that umbrella, but. One, increase size and diversity of trees and canopy. Two, educate citizens value of trees and care. And three, improve health of urban forest. 
Yeah, those seem like at least one and two should probably be kind of like measurable mm -hmm. outcomes. Yeah, I mean, figuring out how to educate citizens, I see that one. Yeah, increase size and diversity of trees. Yeah. We have to figure out what the yeah. bench, the, mm -hmm. you know, the baseline is. And right, yeah, I don't I have no idea. The pre quiz what the... and then the quiz. <laughs> right, yeah. In 10 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does the tree board track um, the work that they're doing? Like if they're putting in a certain number of trees per year, do they have all that tracked somewhere? I um, don't know. Because they, they do a lot of work. I think so because they actually track where the trees are going. Right. So and, and then they actually track right. me not maintenance but they check in on them. So I think right. they must mm -hmm. have that. I mean they I think they planted a hundred trees, a hundred uh, city street trees this year. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well so, on their way to meeting their yeah, goal. Right. Right. And you know and what they were trying to do was to acknowledge the fact that we've lost a lot of the big trees along the streets and many more are sick and probably going to lose them soon. So they try to, you know. A lot of trees get removed, not very many trees get added back in. Right, right. Or in the places, or the necessarily the species that's, that are more adaptable. Rather than replanting maple trees, which or um, ash that were problematic. So. I mean, I think we can also we worked on the landscaping regs already, and that would be part of this, is ensuring there's adequate, what do we call it? We just call it cover? Or do we call it something else? Uh, yeah, we had a couple of different but terms yeah, but for it. Yeah, we had street tree requirements, we had parking lot, and then we had the general landscaping. So if you manage to avoid the first two, we'll catch you on the third one. Well, I think that those would work towards one and two, one and three, sorry, one and three, which are increased size and diversity of trees and, um, and improve health of urban forests. And they've certainly been working on the education with the labels on the trees, actually, downtown, you know, the, for the ash borer. Um, they've actually put labels around the trees, so hopefully people are noticing those. That would be for educate. Yeah, educate, right. So they're they are definitely acting on that. So maybe they determine some kind of a measurable. Well, if not, we can recommend that they maybe think about that one. Yeah. And mm -hmm. even if there isn't a, a necessarily a measurable, certainly the new rules that we adopted um, as interim changes with respect to the street trees and with all trees is that we now require a certain amount of undisturbed area around every tree so even if we can't quantify it we do know qualitatively our new our rules now are going to be protecting you know if you've got a large tree you have to protect 100 square feet around that tree and if it's a smaller tree it might be 64 and if it's a, even smaller it might be 25 square feet but there's where we didn't have rules before you might be able to put a sidewalk right up next to a tree yeah. and leave it no root space. Well, now we've got a requirement that you're going to have to show us where that... A well or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Preferably have a well of some type, but if not, it certainly just at least needs to have the green space that's around it. So we've got some qualitative rules that will help meet the third objective. All right. Move on from tree board. Complete streets. So complete streets is a little, oh, I'll let you read it. They're a little bit of a confusing one because they're, there's the in, tr Transportation Infrastructure Committee, which looks at the streets. Mm -hmm. And then there's complete streets, which looks at more events and at urban, guerrilla urbanism. Well, these goals are kind of, yeah. are they? they're grounded in actual infrastructure. All right. So, uh, goal one is for new ped bike transit projects. Goal two is to reduce surface parking lots. See? <laughs> no, no, just tear down the wreck building and put a surface parking lot. I would cry. Mm. I would no, cry. Would I do think that. that we need parking for Barry Street, but not in not to destroy a historic building to do it. But okay, so. Goal three, expand transportation alternatives. 
So going back to the first goal, new ped bike transit projects. Well, we are on our way with that. I mean, we've got the bike path extension that's happening. And eventually it will be connected, all connected, to the existing bike path. Yes, as soon as we get from Main Street to the rec center. Is it just so there it will be set, that the work that they're doing now will be extended all the way to the rec center? No. Okay. No, other than that gap. We other still than have that the gap. gap. Okay. Which gap can you? From Main Street to the rec center. Right. So from Main right. Street all the way yep. out to the west is all going to be complete, and then from the rec center east to Galveston east. Hill will be all done. But doing. we'll have 600 feet in the middle. Okay. How does this interface with the Transportation Committee? Or is there still a Transportation Committee? There is. And as I said, initially the discussion was they didn't merge into a, a completely unified group because right. one was going to be, one kept wanting to do events and one kept wanting to talk about doing projects and so they eventually split into a events group and a project group. And it looks like now, looking at this, it sounds like they're both being project groups. So oh, we've always wanted to try to keep them as a single transportation committee because we think it's more effective that way. But MTIC is currently considered the transportation committee. That's the one that we staff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what kind of events? I mean, what are, what are um, trying to do things like maybe shut down a neighborhood street on a Saturday so kids could ride their bikes in the street. Um, you know, kind of doing more neighborhood type events to um, get people out. You know, maybe organizing an event where we would shut down the parking on one side of a street, put up cones, so that way people could use that as a as a bikeway for a weekend or for a week. I'm trying to set up those types of opportunities where we can try out new things on a temporary basis. Hmm. Didn't they have some kind of guidelines they developed or uh, some kind of a study? Was there a complete street study? I haven't been stepped. Well, there was, but that yeah. was a street typology. The, okay. Was, so they're the doing the street typology? No. Um, no. MTIC is okay. MTIC was doing complete streets. I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a side question, but whatever happened, wasn't there an E911 effort to label houses <coughs> on the streets? To renumber, yes, and we didn't end up getting the time to get to advance that. It's still on our work list of possible things that we want to work on. Okay. But it hasn't gotten there. We're going to be forced to at some point because we've got certain streets that people have run are not going to be happy. People are not going to be happy, uh, but certain yeah. streets have run out of numbers. <laughs> okay. And we need to fix it. Okay. Sorry for that. Okay. So, I mean, these goals, I think they're pretty easy to. I don't know what expand transportation alternatives encompasses, though. Maybe we should talk about that briefly. I mean. Well, that's that's what the uh, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition's been looking at. So, is this alternatives to cars? Yes, I'm is assuming that? so. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, and and not necessarily relying or assuming that it's going to be more buses in the similar kind of format to what we're doing now. That may be a new, a different way of providing mm -hmm. transportation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so. Um, I'd forgotten that that was actually part of one of theirs, but um, yeah, hopefully everybody's working all together, and the state's interested in it as well. Right, so they should be working with the Energy Committee on this, right? Well, the Energy Committee is sort of um, over watching what the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition is doing. Okay, but so so it's the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition that should be working with the Complete Streets yes, Group on this. Yeah. And maybe I'm not sure. If the, I'm not sure of everyone who was around the table, but okay. Okay, moving on. I think. I mean, I think that we have one more, which is the development review board. So let's just talk about that quickly and try to get through our minutes and get out of here and the next five, ten minutes, because it's pretty hot in here, and I feel everybody's, I'm losing <laughs> yeah. people, so let's just try to be productive in the last few minutes, we'll yeah. me, myself included. So, Development Review Board, okay, 
Um, let me just rattle off what they have here and we can talk about them. So provide consistent and fair review of projects. So not really a mm -hmm. city plan goal, but good. Uh, clear and flexible standards. So yeah, that's what we try for. Parking, comprehensive slash realistic plan, which has been identified again and again. And the last piece is an advanced long-term sustainability goals. So I think, you know, my take of their presentation was that they just, they're trying to figure out how to interpret and apply the regulations with these goals in mind. Those are the purpose, so. I don't think we need to talk too much about that. Unless What's their definition yeah. of sustainability? Yeah. Yeah. How? Uh, well, they'll get that in the rest of the city plan. I don't know. Yeah. I, yes, we will inform that. I are guess. they talking about yeah resilience, or are they talking yeah? I mean, yeah. Anyway, um, I don't know because I, I mean we could go back and review, but I'm not sure. My yeah, sense is that it probably that had to do with the sustainable Montpelier coalition ideas, but maybe not. I mean, it, it seems like everybody has a appreciation for the net zero competition and the Team Bridges proposal and the other proposals. All of these committees seem to appreciate different aspects of them. So I think using some of those ideas from those proposals as anchors would be really useful developing the city plan. Sorry, can I digress just a, a bit about that on the design competition? Because when you said that, it reminded me. When I went on to our Google Drive, um, the only one that's on it is the bridges, currently the bridges information. I couldn't access the workbook because it wasn't functional. Okay. And, and the other ones are not on it. And since we reviewed all five of them, of the finalists, it seems like it might be appropriate to have at least some information. Maybe they're their overview board, uh, right? And we want to be mm -hmm. taking a look at all of those. Um, Mike, can you add those to that? I'll try to see what I can come up with. Is it easy for you to add stuff to that, Mike, to our Google Drive? I think you can it's add them drag too, and, Barb. It's drag and drop as far drag as I've drop? done it. Okay, yeah. all right. So if you, if you see something that you think should be on there, you could, and you have access to that document, you should well, feel free to upload it. I might just not have, you know, dug deep enough in the rabbit hole, but I, it seems like there are lots of things like the Greening of America's Capitals plan I didn't see on, you know, the other plans that we have that the yeah, city I has. Don't think, yeah, I think there are a number of things that aren't, aren't there yet. Aren't there yet. Yeah. Um, and somewhere on there I know that we have the draft for the energy section, but I get into it. <coughs> yeah, I, what I saw didn't have a lot in it. Yeah, and I so and I I've been trying to work on some stuff so I can meet with you at some point. Oh great. Okay. Cuz yeah, I tried But I to couldn't find when John was like, "Oh yeah, we worked on a whole bunch of stuff and it was right. and it's on there." And I looked and I'm like, "Well, there's not a whole yeah. lot there." So. Unless I'm just not finding it. It could no, be. No, I there. didn't find it either. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. And he's more tech savvy than yeah. I. So. Oh, <laughs> well, he's also but. just busy, so no, I mean, <laughs> oh my, more oh yeah. If he can't find it, then maybe it really isn't there. So anyway, thanks. Sorry for the digression. Does the Energy Advisory Committee with a goals and strategies for the city plan document that's in here under partners? But I'm only seeing, yeah, I'm only seeing bridges. Um, and can, if you click on the workbook for Team Bridges, can you, does it um, download? And it's from the plan website. It's not where I would have thought to. Yeah. That's the workbook. Work yeah, it has it in there. I just can't it does. scroll it down. Okay. All right. Because I couldn't get anything other than the cover to, to load. All right. But it, that's the only one that's in there. Yeah. Okay. So the workbook. I can, I'll can. i look for the rest of the presentation, but I don't have to worry about the workbook. I guess not. No. Everything related to Team Bridges, there were four documents all together. Right. It's four. just the Team Bridges. Right. But the other teams, yeah. 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 We'll see if I can find the other teams. Or at least, if not the yeah, whole workbooks, that yes. might be um, more difficult, but at least the boards. Yeah. Yeah, the boards and the boards. Right. And that, I think, having all five of them would be helpful. Yeah, agreed. Whew. 
Okay, so as far as the visioning statement for the city plan is concerned, I'm going to compile all my notes and type them up, and then the conversation can resume, you know, looking at all of these, just to see, try to tie it all together and, and come up with a visioning statement. Do you want to send those out? Is it yeah. worth us individually trying to each come up with something or putting a few together and then talking about it so we're looking at it in yeah, I mean, maybe if people want to try to come up with something, that would be very we could end up helpful for the discussion. Yeah. And if you don't want to put together a sentence or two, you could just start like say, here are the key things that I'm seeing themes about, and just do bullets. Mm, bullets, yeah. yeah. How long are you imagining this visioning statement being? No, just a sentence or two. Okay, that's when it gets I, hard. Yeah. yeah, when you have to if get it down. We can get it down to something really. Concise, that people could actually remember. I think that's yeah. Yeah, I want to try to go and see if, if I can find it. I thought um, the name Muldrow there. Um, we had a consultant do a visioning statement. Oh. And I can't remember where I got where it is or where, where it was associated with. But I'll try to see if I can find it. Yeah. Okay. Oh. But it was professionally developed, and they're really good. Professionally written sentence. Well, it's a well, it's, it's a, a paragraph. Whole document. <laughs> yeah. These are the ones that we always we always chuckle about. I, I work and then you I work read. in words for a living, but I'm still that's still one where I'm like, but we paid. He's a, really. I'll like to write a sentence. They're actually really. Um, <laughs> he, he does it all around the country, and it's it's remarkable that he'll sit down and talk to these guys, and he'll write this whole thing up, and you're just like, oh, that's good. So that, <laughs> that's really that, good, but I can't remember. That's a piece we want to include That's a piece then in our city plan. full of rainbows yeah. and butterflies. Oh. City yeah. full of rainbows and butterflies. Uh, Something better than I can put together. Uh, yeah. city full of <laughs> but I remember when he he also did it. He's done it for a number of communities in in Vermont, including Barry when I was there as well. And that was where they came up with Barry Works, and you know they went through. You know, they would have a sentence, and then it was Barry Works, and it was this, and it was Barry Works, and it was this, and it was Barry Works. And so it was before you were here. It well. Barry was really while I was there, and then we came, when we came here, I was pretty sure it was while Ashley was here that I think Montpelier Alive had him come in. Oh. Okay. I've just been trying to pick my brain. I remember sitting in a meeting here. They are going to go and All steal right. it. But We've let got me find it, and right. I'll try to yeah. get it to you. It's your action item. And our action item is to pull themes from the committee goals and put them in bullet points. Yeah. And not too many, Barb. I know, <laughs> it's so hard. Yeah. yeah. So we each kind of the, bring them to the meeting in July, is that the... Mm -hmm. Okay. But can we circulate them to the entire group? Sure, just don't reply with substantive feedback. Right. Don't... <laughs> don't say nice, nice job. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. No, all right. No. Okay, no comment. Received. Received. <laughs> okay. Just reply to the one person. Yes. Okay, that's, that's pretty basic. All right. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes from May 13th? Just from, cross out from after goal. Um, our goal is, um, for the city to eliminate their reliance on fossil fuels. And just take out eventually, because, I mean, these are goals, right? So this is what we're, yes. all of the these. City to, to eliminate, eliminate its, its, its reliance on yep. fossil fuels. Got it. For our reliance. It's, it's city is it it. an it. Otherwise, I got thrown out of the city in there. People. <laughs> Right, okay, great. <laughs> Full of people with good grammatical skills. <laughs> I'm used to writing zoning regulations, so I'm why do we avoiding have, the, the Why pronouns. do we have to hire someone to write a sentence, says Kirby? <laughs> Make sure it's it's. it's. Well, see? Off of that for Make free. Make sure we don't use the same word, same word in, in one sentence, you know, those kinds of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, any other clarifications? Okay, the minutes with that edit are approved. So the final item on our agenda, which I've written all over, so let's see, um, is to adjourn.